three age group. Yeah. Okay. Recording in progress. Okay. So black disabled men have been tasked with making a way out of no way for themselves and others. Usually we are absent from the public in a culture that defines anything that isn't typical. Uh, they define it as weakness, right? Uh, poor disabled black men have much to offer the national discourse around health, divesting from capitalism and anti-racism efforts, right? Uh, I cannot say how many times I have sat through sermons or policy discussions uh, lifted up by people who would be quote unquote able-bodied. And I have thought to myself, if only they would have run this by a black disabled man. All right, so uh, we, we've got things to say. The South has something to say, black men have something to say. So since the inception of this nation, Black men have labored along with Black women to survive and to thrive, right? And I would be remiss if I didn't mention disability in our narrative, as I recognize one of the major disabling factors that still persists is racism. It is white supremacy, right? And of course, ableism too. Uh, yes, there are people that are born in the society with disability, um, but racism has, has played uh, a, a huge part, right? So racism has made many Black men disabled during the heights of American chattel slavery. We know that through harsh punishment, through lack of nourishment, through lack of resources, various mental health struggles have come up um, and have been exacerbated by a society that does not love us back. And still, uh, Black men have persisted. Black men have overcome and, and risen, and sometimes risen with and in spite of those things that have disabled us. Black men were and are tasked with surviving after the cruelty of slavery um, in our society. And as a theologian, I pause there to reflect on the remarkable nature of a generation of Black people made disabled and who rose from the ashes and obtained their freedom, built their families, made wealth, and clung to their concepts of divine, the divine. And uh, that brings us to our current day <laughs> and another mass disabling event that has struck Black communities, right, in the form of the COVID-19 virus. Uh, Kelly Brown Douglas, the theologian, says in her book, Resurrection Hope, uh, she speaks to the various ways that Black people have found themselves and fought for themselves in this crisis. Uh, she notes the need of a God who is Black, who identifies with the struggle of Black people. And she writes, uh, as Black death was becoming more and more routine in the nation, whether at the hands of the police or from COVID-19 virus. She talks about her son challenging her. My son challenged my faith in a black Christ and a God who actually cares about uh, black people. So we know that this pandemic has painfully illuminated the underlying disabilities of black men. Lots of conversations about comorbidities <laughs> Uh, seem to flatten out the experiences of Black men already ex existing with disabilities. Um, when systems of care and prevention were put into place, governmental agencies, church body schools, all of those seem to bypass Black men uh, in various walks uh, of life and influence. What would Black men who are disabled have to say about how to sustain vi vibrant community, knowing that we already have to cultivate those for ourselves. Um, what wisdom do Black disabled men bring to churches that found themselves tacked with creating digital community spaces? I heard a lot about that. Um, I didn't see a lot of roundtables with Black disabled men. Um, 
And so we are tasked with creating a better future, a new future. And as articles and governing bodies push to return to normal, Black disabled men know that this isn't possible. Uh, normal wasn't working for us. And it's not working for a lot of you either, right? Uh, and I want to return to the question that I asked you earlier about naming prominent di Black disabled men. Did you find that difficult to name and imagine Black disabled men, both in, in, in society, in celebrity, you know, hood, uh, and the academy? What do you think that says about society? What do you think that it says about your own interpersonal relationships, knowing that one in four Black adults are disabled. What do you think that means in terms of resource allocation, right? And so we know that if you cannot see us, if you cannot envision us, I know that we are not included in the, the conversations around patriarchy and around masculinity, uh, right? When I think about the rest, that I, as a theologian, seek to uh, obtain, I think of, of obtaining rest for the Black disabled man, both now with the resources of our society and our communities and in the afterlife. You know, Jesus promises disciples resources both now and in the age to come, right? And so I wanna leave you with uh, some words from uh, uh, dear brother, uh, Frederick Joseph, who talks about his work with toxic masculinity and patriarchy as well as, as his own disabling journey. He said, after spending most of my morning at the dog park, I promptly sat down at my MacBook and attempted to unlock it so I could begin writing. Though it was much later than I preferred and had intended. As I motioned to type my password, still stiff from what felt like Arctic winds, uh, my hands refused. I had been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis nearly a decade before, and this is a typical symptom. So Frederick's uh, story is moving to me as he talks about being a Black man, disabled, and not heard in society, not listened to. Uh, black disabled men, we serve in spaces that were not meant for us, and we strive along with the rest of our community to make meaning to create liberation out of thin air, and we cry painful tears when our disability runs up against capitalism and white supremacy, when our disabilities are not treated with tender care by other Black men or women. We are here, we have been, and we will be in the future. And here are a few resources that I would recommend for you all. And thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. And I hope I was able to make much uh, black disabled men. Thank you, Mr. Monson, for uh, raising our awareness of the need to see black disabled men. Our next uh, discussion is uh, I'm going to try to make a better path for the new era of us, critical conversation spaces, spaces as consciousness raising context for young black women. Uh, this uh, discussion was uh, with Gabrielle Cooley. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Thank you. Hey, you're, uh, Mel Yang, Mira Johnson, Jamal S. Matthews. Uh, it will be presented to us today uh, by Ms. Ms. Kuby. Uh, she is a doctoral student at University of Michigan's combined program in education and psychology. Uh, she is interested in the development of intersectional awareness among Black girls and women, as well as young Black people's development of a critical consciousness as they navigate educational institu institutions and how young black people from their conceptions of race as they as they develop and navigate in the aforementioned ways. Ms. Kuby. Do I need to share my screen for the Zoom people? Or? Um, yeah, you will. Okay. Um, click on the PowerPoint icon to find your PowerPoint. There'll be another one up there, but it's going to be too hard to rotate once. And then, yeah, you'll want to share your Zoom screen. Oops. Oh, let me get my notes up. Okay. 
So good morning, everyone. Um, as was mentioned before, my name is Gabrielle Kuby. I'm a third year PhD student in education and psychology at the University of Michigan. And today I'll be presenting findings from a project of mine entitled, I'm going to try to make a better path um, for the new era of us critical conversation spaces as consciousness raising context for young black women. So firstly, I'd like to walk you through a little bit of the research um, that kind of underpinned my programming and the analysis that I conducted. So firstly, let's kind of reach um, a common definition of critical conversation spaces, just so that we're all operating from the same framework. So um, critical conversation spaces or CCSs are affinity groups that are facilitated by and for Black girls and girls of color with scaffolding from Black women and women of color educators. And these spaces um, center fictive kinship um, through reflection on a common issue or theme, oftentimes having to do um, with gender, race, or the intersection between these things and focusing on we can, how we can kind of feel these familial bonds, even with people that we may not be related to through these sorts of conversations. So the original work on critical conversation spaces was posed um, by Carter Andrews and colleagues in 2019, and she um, discusses these uh, interventions or methods as a one-time incident. So researchers came in, they had these conversations with young girls during schools, and then they left. But then there were resulting tensions because the girls were wondering when the researchers would return um, to continue having these conversations with the girls. But timing and personnel constraints um, that schools face kind of preventing the realization of this need. And so Carter Andrews and colleagues recommended that future research look into what it would mean for girls to have um, these conversations in a recurrent sort of continuous manner. And so since um, 2019, um, research has kind of investigated what it looks like to have these repeated conversations for girls and how this has utility um, for their development. So in order to kind of expand on that research and to justify the need for these sorts of spaces in schools, I thought that an evidence-based curriculum that kind of um, explains or helps to facilitate CCSs would allow schools to see their merit and would also allow educators to continuously draw out, excuse me, these rich understandings about social systems, justice, race, and gender that Black girls possess, but that we don't always get to bear witness to if we only have these sorts of conversations with them one time as opposed to continuously. This slide is OK, so this is what made um, my partnership with Horizon High School sort of a perfect opportunity um, to pursue um, investigating these questions. So in November of 2021, the assistant principal of Horizon High reached out to my faculty advisors at the University of Michigan, looking for a graduate student who would be interested in doing this identity-based um, consciousness raising work with their girls um, and their students broadly, and that was me. Um, another thing that made this partnership with Horizon High um, very timely and particular, um, particularly uh, of worth um, was the presence of something during the school day called seminars. So at Horizon, the last hour block of the school day um, is reserved for things that would traditionally be after school activities or extracurriculars um, to kind of excite the students and keep them engaged during the school day following the resumption of in-person instruction as the pandemic subsided in our community. So despite Horizon being a predominantly Black high school, the seminar offerings that for, for girls focus more so on topics of professional development and financial wellness. And so they didn't have a specific space to meditate on their identities. And when this sort of socio-political content was engaged, it was oftentimes done through a masculine lens. So a teacher made an anecdote about college access and inequity and the exceptionalism inherent in um, those sorts of topics and issues um, for Black men in that oftentimes they're socialized or told explicitly that they won't attain that college access if they don't get um, athletic scholarships. And so talking about college inequity through this traditionally masculine lens of sports was not as engaging for the girls in the space. Um, they became quieter, they weren't involved in these conversations. And so even during those sort of um, off moments when these sorts of topics were being engaged, the girls weren't necessarily getting to participate. So thinking about um, my classroom observations and interactions, I started to think specifically about what I wanted my programming to do and how I would have tied these objectives back to um, you know, existing research. And so the main um, theoretical framework through which I did this was um, the positive youth development model for girls of color. And this model articulates that these green, more traditional positive youth development assets, like competence and confidence for girls of color, 
should radiate from a central ethos of critical consciousness. And this is um, an idea of marginalized young people being able to um, critically analyze social systems, make systemic attributions for inequality, and um, eventually develop a desire to resist against these forms of oppression. And so um, when these girls develop these traditional positive youth development assets through this ethos of critical consciousness, they're able to resist oppression, as I mentioned before, and to be resilient in the face of it. Moreover, I wanted to center collectivism as a framework in my um, programming, which is a tenet of radical healing psychology, wherein marginalized people um, heal from oppression, not just in isolation, but do so in community with others who share those marginalized experiences. And I was also thinking constantly about refusals um, in my programming and my analysis. So what community knowledge did I think it was necessary to keep between myself and my girls, myself and my school partners, and myself and my research teams, as not to extrapolate um, these narratives to other parties in the academy who may misuse them and who may be more interested in deficit narratives about our young Black people. So here I wanted to show specifically how the objectives of my programming align with that main framework of the positive youth development for girls of color. So in developing a sense of sisterhood and collective identity, the girls would cultivate the tenets of connection and caring. And being able to develop a sense of self-value that aided their connection to our community, the girls would cultivate the asset of confidence. And in being able to define their identities on their own terms and while still understanding how misguided notions of who they are um, may be held by others, girls would develop um, competence as well as character. So I've talked a little bit about how um, you know, theory and um, the actual practice of being in the school community impacted my work, but I also wanted to talk about how my subjectivity and my own identities kind of played into this project. And these are pictures of me and my family. <laughs> so um, when I think about my positionality, the two words that come to mind specifically are relationality and purpose. And so that positive youth development for girls of color model articulates the importance of relationality, um, wherein girls are forming trusting relationships with adults in their lives, where they can derive a sense of purpose interpersonally, as well as a sense of purpose like throughout their development more broadly. So similarly, as I began my graduate research career, I was looking for this sense of purpose and relationality in my work, because I started graduate school um, during the pandemic. My first year of graduate school was entirely online, um, I'm from Northern Virginia, so in going to Michigan, I was moving 10 hours away from home, and I didn't really have any social connections um, to other folks, uh, aside from the ones that I'd already had prior to the pandemic. So as I got further along um, in my research career, in my graduate program, and I had the space to in, uh, pursue research questions that were intrinsically motivating to me, and not to um, engage in projects just because I felt a pressure to produce or achieve or assert my worth um, as a Black woman in a predominantly white space. I thought about how those ideas about my worth and my competence are already inherently assumed like when I'm spending time with my family. So as the youngest daughter to my parents, as a baby sister to my two older sisters and my brother-in-laws, and an auntie to my two nieces who are in the back today, I love you all. I think about how I can replicate the care and the preciousness and the celebration that we try to afford to one another. Oh, and there's my cousin. <laughs> that we try to afford to one another um, um, in my work with Black youth in schools and Black girls specifically when they're in these schooling contexts that are steeped in white supremacy and may not care about or celebrate them in those same ways. So um, these are the findings of my work, um, thinking about my positionality, um, my school interactions, and the theory altogether. If you'd like to talk about the methods and the specific analysis, we can definitely do that during the question and answer. So the specific question that will, well, I can't really say it, but the specific question that was guiding um, my evaluation of my programming was what needs, wants, and ideas of Black girls should a critical conversation-based curriculum foreground and there were six themes that I developed in um, response to this research question. The first of those being vibe, followed by diversity, critical consciousness, resistance and resilience, assurance, competence, and confidence, as well as revisions and improvements. But for the sake of time today, I'll only concentrate on a few of these themes and sub-themes. So the first one I'd like to talk to you all about today is vibe as relational. So when we were beginning to start this programming and I was having conversations with girls, they were saying that something was important to them was a space where they could kind of have good vibes with people 
and catch a good vibe. And that's the space that we created. But when I asked them, what does that vibe mean? Like, what does it feel like? They were saying it was undescribable. It felt like they were around their soulmates. And so we began to think about vibe as something that's spiritual or psychic that allows us to sort of disarm ourselves when we're in the presence of people that we get along with um, and because we are, there's not a sense of power differentials in this space. And so this vibe as relational was achieved through feelings of rest and welcome, where in the space centered communal feelings and co-construction. And so here we have a quote um, from one of my girls um, named Violet for research purposes, um, wherein she says, when I'm connected to my ancestors, it's just amazing. I'm like all the blood, sweat, and tears and trauma y'all went through. I'm going to try to make a better path for the new era of us like when I connected to y'all. Um, when I connected to all my people as a colored person, it's like a different um, vibration. It's a different energy or aura that I love. So here we see Violet articulating the importance of connection and caring and building this relational vibe, which is a specific asset um, spoken to in the positive youth development for girls of color model. Moreover, she talks about this relationality, not just as one that she feels with her peers or her facilitators in the program, but as something that allows her to reach back and connect intergenerationally um, to her ancestors. So we can think about this vibe as relational, not just as folks getting along in the present moment, but doing so in such a, a way that allows them to spiritually connect back to their ancestors and then to reorient um, their futures towards wanting to build those caring communities for others. Um, another way through which we achieve this relational vibe was sharing our astrological signs with each other. And so when I would do something, it'd be like, oh, Gabby's like that because she's a Gemini. So when we think about those astrological signs and the personality traits that are assigned to them, that's also a means through which the girls were able to kind of understand or anticipate what they might get from one another. And that helped us to kind of co-construct norms for how we wanted to interact with each other um, as facilitators and as peers. In the, space. the second theme I'd like to talk to you all about today was critical consciousness, wherein girls were critically examining their social worlds in a way that was orienting them towards a commitment to social justice. So here we have um, royalty articulating the nature of anti-Black racism in the United States, talking about how biracial um, Black white people are kind of posed as a buffer class in this racist system, and how this buffer class status is derived um, as a remnant from um, slavery, wherein light-skinned folks were afforded the privilege of domestic labor. And so here um, we have royalty relying on these socio-historical attributions when explaining her thoughts about race and color, and her peers did so as well, um, and engaged in this sort of reflection about topics of gender and desirability as well. Um, in her specific individual interview, royalty relied on these critical attributions when explaining um, how she presented or prevented herself from internalizing colorist messages about light-skinned folks and about dark-skinned folks. And all the girls in the space engaged in a form of localized critical reflection where they were articulating their lived experiences with racism in such a way that um, motivated them to want to resist that um, racist oppression in their lives. So it was not just the case that girls were kind of analyzing things through a singular lens of racism, but that they were exhibiting their intersectional awareness. And so girls were critically examining their social worlds through an intersectional lens and highlighting the interlocking nature of multiple forces of oppression. So here we have Kira articulating that not everybody lives in a big house when they're Black women. The way that society sets us up is harder for us. I don't see a lot of white women get pregnant early. I see a lot of Black girls have that happen to them. Like it's sad. It's just like harder for us. And so here Kira is explicitly mentioning the intersection between multiple social forces. She's naming the specific impacts of classism on um, Black women by virtue of the gendered racism that's endemic to the United States. And she's saying that these uh, material privileges of like a high socioeconomic status are something that is kind of reserved for white women despite them sharing a gender identity with black women by virtue of you know, the privileges afforded by whiteness. She also poses um, early pregnancy as a specific intersectional challenge for black women that white women do not face um, by virtue of this system of class gendered racism. She says that early pregnancy is something that happens to black girls. She doesn't say, um, they get pregnant early because they're fast or promiscuous or they're making poor life choices, she attributes it to this specific intersectional system and the specific privileges um, that, you know, white women are afforded in that they don't have to um, contend with this specific challenge. Still, though, um, we saw girls who were beginning to cultivate or just struggling to articulate this intersectional awareness. So royalty says that sometimes she believes that monoracial Black girls 
are jealous of mixed girls because they're prettier or better or their skin will get all of the guys. So even though on the previous slide, we saw royalty making these systemic attributions for racism and colorism, when I was asking her to think intersectionally about gender colorism, she went back and made these sort of individual level attributions about jealousy. So girls were at different points in this intersectional awareness, but it was something that was being cultivated and meditated upon in this space. And lastly, girls had several <clears throat> ideas for revisions and improvements they wanted to see to the critical conversation space in order for it to better meet their needs. So they wanted to collaborate more, be more creative, learn more about women's rights, and they were also interested in learning about beauty standards and desirability as these topics have bearings on Black women's um, conceptualizations of themselves. And so lastly, um, I'd just like to leave you with a few takeaways and a little bit of an orientation about where my work is going to go. So in doing this sort of consciousness raising work with young Black women, it's very important that we listen to and learn from them in ways that are not hierarchical, that we be attentive to gendered and gendered racial differences and their schooling experiences and the way that they're treated, that we provide them unique resources where they can feel cared for and where they can engage in this kind of learning alongside their friends, and that we focus on care in this work. Something that came very organically out of the programming was a sense of communal care and an understanding of the importance of self-care. And this is something that I'd like to continue to investigate as I include new facilitators in the program and see how they care for girls, how the girls learn to care for them um, as they co-construct these projects about identity, belonging, and racism. So I'll show you one more slide. Okay, yeah. So um, I'd like to say thank you all for your care and attention today. Um, thank you specifically to the girls with whom I did my programming, my school partners, my research team, um, Mara and Mel especially, um, my research assistants and my peers at the University of Michigan, as well as my funders. Um, and this is my contact information, and I'll be happy to hear some more from you all during the question and answer portion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gabrielle. Your work with the Verizon uh, High Girls is fascinating. Uh, thank you for raising their voices today for us. Uh, we look forward to hearing more from this project. Um, our next speaker is um, Dr. Greg Suzanne Ferguson. She will be speaking. Um, her title is CRT uh, in Education and the Just Names Project. Dr. Ferguson is the founder of Mothers of Diversity America and director of its Just Names Project, working across the country to eradicate the symbolic violence of public school names honoring white supremacy in the Confederacy. She is a director for a federal program at Hampton University with articles published in the Washington Post. Richmond Fresh Free Press, Charleston Gazette, and the Southern Poverty Law Center periodical Teaching Tolerance. She holds a BA in the History of Art and Architecture from Harvard University and an, a master's in school counseling and a doctorate in education and leadership studies from Marshall University. Dr. Ferguson. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. Um, I'm going to start my timer as I turn it around. Good morning, Stel. Um, so, good morning. Um, my presentation is about a triumphant struggle. I should, I'll say triumphant now. Um, we we uh, have been victorious in, in part in our struggle, but it's uh, it's a personal uh, journey um, in a way for me. Um, and I just want to go over briefly some of the steps that were taken by what turned out to be a coalition, um, thankfully, to get the name of some schools in West Virginia and in Virginia uh, changed um, from those honoring white supremacists. Um, the pendulum didn't swing all the way through to those, in some cases, to those honoring um, uh, um, um, uh, African American heroes and heroines, but they were neutralized at the very least. So uh, it's called the Just Names Pro Just Names Project, um, and it's uh, short for Equity and Justice uh, in Public Schools Names. 
Um, it's uh, presented by Mothers of Diversity America, which is a nonprofit that I founded um, to uh, use as a vehicle for this project, actually. Uh, so um, for all of you researchers out there, it's a great opportunity. I want to say this was um, this was like fire shut up in my bones and, <laughs> and I had to do it. Um, I had to do it and I had to find a way to do it as a public educator for over 25 years um, coming out of uh, uh, har like um, underserved neighborhoods, I cut my teeth in Harlem schools and I found myself in West Virginia, West by God, Virginia <laughs> at some point. Um, um, when my parents, that's where they retired, and I went there to um, to help them navigate um, their their golden years. Um, I found some refuge there um, um, because of this, you know, bucolic uh, wilderness and wild, wonderful, uh, you know, natural setting. Uh, but there was a lot of um, um, unconscious bias, and I'll say unconscious bias because West Virginia is kind of um, lauded as a state that was created out of the secession from Virginia during the Civil War, but it was a secession that was, uh, uh, that was um, out of necessity um, because Western Virginia could not, um, basically, they could not um, benefit from uh, the plantation lifestyle of slavery in Virginia because it's, it's in the Appalachian Mountains. So uh, they were not getting any economic value from the whole industry um, of slavery. And so, um, however, um, its constitution actually adopted the Virginia constitution. So there was slavery in West Virginia um, um, during the Civil War. Um, so um, I, I found myself in West Virginia uh, carrying on with my um, counseling role in the schools there in Kanawha County, West Virginia. And I saw a problem. I saw a problem when I was asked to go to a school on the west side of Charleston, which is kind of, I call it Herbalachian. It's urban and Appalachian. <laughs> and so it has the social woes of being in inner city, but also the, you know, regional woes of being in a distressed Appalachian region. Um, but this area of, of, of west, uh, west Charleston had a school and it had been named in 1940 after the preeminent uh, historic figure in West Virginia who happened to be Stonewall Jackson. And I'd walk into the school and I said, wait a minute, my history escapes me. I was an art major, I was a counselor, but wasn't Stonewall Jackson a Confederate general? Now, mind you, in 1940, when the school was named, it was touted uh, as a proud name given to a school um, in 1940, not, in, not 18... Uh, 80, 1940, during the massive resistance, um, and culprits of massive resistance were United Daughters of the Confederacy, and they went around the United States trying, you know, they they perpetuated the lost the lost cause um, narrative of the Civil War, and they wanted to honor all of those who were lost um, in in the war um, on the Confederate side. So they propagated this narrative. They tried to change textbooks um, to, uh, to, to you know, uh, perpetuate the myth that it was a lost cause and it had nothing to do with slavery. It was about you know, uh, people coming in and trying to take away states, states' rights to govern. So I walk into this school and I saw nothing in the foyer that would tell me who this guy was. Now, mind you, this area had been on the hills overlooking the flats. Um, and the hills had been a segregated area of Charleston, West Virginia. The flats had been where um, poor whites and um, slaves had lived. Um, there were salt mines in the area and the, the hills were where the plantations and the big houses were and it had been segregated up until 1954. Um, so, uh, however, um, after Brown versus Board of Education, um, when they had um, about seven black students uh, bust into uh, this school to uh, integrate the school. Um, the school, this, the demographics in the area changed. There was white flight and the neighborhood had become um, a, a very large percentage of African-Americans at 20%. Now in West Virginia, that's a lot of African-Americans. Yes, state only has 4%. Um, but in this particular school, 
there were 54% of, of African American um, uh, populations or people of color in this school at this time in 2000. And I was just like, what is happening here? And to my, I guess my, I guess my had joy and disappointment. There was nothing to say why the school in the four year, there was nothing paying homage to Stonewall Jackson. Um, and um, I wondered, you know, how the school system in this, now I'm coming from New York, so I have to be very careful how I trade. <laughs> but I wondered how, 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 how folks could, could abide with this. So I went around and asked people, you know, you know, why, the, why this was going on, why the school was still named after this person. And there was just no great awareness. There was just no consciousness about it. People were really concerned, especially my educator peers were really concerned about what was being taught in the schools. And I get it. They said they're a big fish, fish to fry, honey. We just need to, we just need to go in and do the work, which I did. Um, until one day when a young man from the football team handed me a sweatshirt. And on the sweatshirt was this, you know, very quaffed gentleman in that hearty style, Confederate hat with the cross sword. And he was really buff, but his face was a black guy. And I said, this is the mascot of our school. It's a Confederate African-American raffle wearing the Confederate emblem. We've gone too far. I'm sorry. I just, you know, I know it might have been low hanging fruit, but I was, I was just concerned that we were worried about, you know, ferreting out unconscious bias in our testing and in our facilities and in our diagnosis of disabilities, things of that nature. And, 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 but this, you know, how could we tell our students that we had, we were on their side, especially our African-American students, if we uh, let this continue? So I found the problem, I started writing about it. <laughs> <laughs> and I started walking around with petitions. And, um, you know, I was met on the corners, I went on the west side, I talked to the guys on the corner and they were really angry that they didn't know who Stonewall Jackson was. They were very angry and they were also more, more embarrassed that they, they, they had, you know, their lack of miseducation that caused them to, you know, go into fields where they couldn't really write their names on the, on the bat, on the, uh, on the, um, petition, you know, because they wanted to maintain their anonymity. Um, but they were angry, you know, they were embarrassed at their lack of, of knowledge about, you know, who they had, been honoring with their talents, with their skills. And I would go to track meets and hear um, over the loudspeaker, uh, Stonewall Jackson wins again and see a beautiful brown girl running across the finish line. And I'd look up in the bleachers and I'd see some people high five in and some other people low five in. And I just wondered, is this, is this something that is, is being done? Is it, is it, is it a, map, a mockery? Is it a mockery? Is it is it just hapless or is it purpose? Um, and so I started writing articles. And so in doing that, um, I um, I wrote for the Washington Post over the years. Um, I, I got um, in the early uh, 2000s when I started this mission, um, just as a, a media campaign, I got um, a lot of um, a lot of um, notoriety, I'll say. I got a lot of notoriety and uh, my uh, safety was was in jeopardy. So I retreated, <laughs> I retreated. My, my uh, peers at the university said, you know, the pen is mightier than the sword, girl. This is, you need to come inside the cubicle and write, which I did. I cannot believe I went 10 minutes talking about this. And I started writing. <laughs> I started writing and I wrote on research that would contribute to an analysis of where public school naming fits into the contemporary cultural landscape. I wanted to contribute to a, a potential um, battle in the, in the courts about the constitutionality of public schools. There are over 200 schools still. Well, at this point, we've had some successes. Right now, there should be somewhere in the midst of 150 to 160 schools, mostly across the South, still named after Confederates and white supremacists in the nation. And so the premise of the, of the research was that educational leadership programs have an ethical responsibility to interrogate these systems. And we wanted to evaluate the subtleties of school names and culture shaping the identities of students, teachers, and their communities. I thought this work, I, I, I did work around critical race theory. That's a bad word now. I couldn't believe it. I saw CNN saying critical race theory. I thought I was the only one who knew what CRT was in the whole state. And then CNN or somebody in Florida, DeSantis or somebody started 
you know, targeting CRT. I mean, but really just puts, it puts life in context. So basically that's all any, you know, critical work does. It's put, it, it puts, you know, our existence in context of the times. And, and I don't understand how people don't know that. And I also worked with uh, Derek Alderman, who is a cultural geographer in Tennessee. I've used a lot of his work and we do presentations on, on, on these um, issues across the country. So I decided to do an auto ethnography. So anyone who doesn't know that, that's when you are part of the participating sample of your work, because I wanted my voice to be heard in those rooms as well. Um, and I named uh, uh, the, um, the research, the perceptions and effects of schools names on black professional educators and their students. So it's qualitative and auto ethnography. Um, and we had a race-centered convenient sample from the Black uh, Caucus of the NEA, from some of the Panhellenic sororities and fraternities, and then from teachers on the west side of Charleston. So we started uh, started local, and then we branched out to um, to look at some national issues. Um, so we wanted to see what their perceptions revealed, um, and through the um, through the prism of um, of cultural geography, there's three tenets. Uh, there's symbolic capital, symbolic resistance, and symbolic violence. So naming places and land and landmarks can present those effects on people. They can be used as symbolic capital, especially schools. Um, they can be used as symbolic resistance where people are trying to change the times, or they can be present violence whenever you go into a place or roam through parks and you see landmarks, um, you know, um, honoring people who should not be honored. Um, so as a lot of our educators that um, I interviewed had gone through segregation, segregation themselves, they had been educated themselves in segregated um, institutions, um, and they found that, you know, there were always ways of doing critical race curriculums, there were critical race pedagogies that they missed when they were integrated, um, when they were um, forced to, to integrate. Um, they found that, um, that um, it helped to shape their consciousness and pride as students, um, and then it helped them to, you know, be Become civically engaged. Um, educators who um, saw that um, schools were named after prominent Blacks, you know, um, there was another school in the same area that we fought to get named after um, um, uh, Mary C. Snow, who was an educator, a local educator we wanted to honor, and it was a really hard fight when we finally had, had it named after her. We were able to um, introduce um, CRC, um, encourage CRP, which enhanced student engagement and community engagement. And they were able to give back more readily to the black community. And in the school that was named after Stonewall Jackson, where some of the teachers, some of my, my, um, my um, uh, participants were from, it, 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 did, it did cause symbolic violence to them. It was a microaggression every time they walked in and they didn't want to have their name as teacher of the year at Stonewall Jackson for a lifetime. And it also presented those challenges as a high school for a lot of the young people who would forever be attached to the name of a, of a white supremacist, you know, uh, or with their diplomas. Um, so it gave, it gave them also an emotional barrier to giving back. Um, and exacerbated tensions created by racial microaggressions of their colleagues. So it was already in an environment where, uh, okay, if someone may have had a microaggression that was isolated, it just exacerbated that. And then a question America's ideals. Um, so um, I'm just gonna go quickly through this. So I wanna, in, in the interest of time, um, so, when um, when there were schools named after prom prominent blacks, um, it um, uh, socioeconomic factors were overarching challenges in a black inner city community were revealed. Um, the significance of the name uh, predicated on CRC and community's cultural awareness was made more prominent. Um, and uh, it was symbolic capital that framed the hidden curricula of a positive school environment and culture. And it was used as a springboard um, in schools that were named after white supremacists. It did none of that. And so the reason that I did this work, and it, and and I have some uh, I have some um, QR codes if you're interested in, in in looking at it, is because I wanted to use it going forward um, as the Clark Doll studies were used. The Clark Doll, Doll Studies, Kenneth and Mamie Clark in 1939, they were commissioned by the NAACP to do the Doll Studies. 
And if any of you are aware of those doll studies, how many of you are aware of the doll studies? Okay. And the dolls were, one was white, one was black, and they were introduced to um, African-American uh, children, and they were asked to select which they like better, and they all chose the white dolls. So that was the doll study. I was like, so there is behavioral realism in the Supreme Court, because the Supreme Court used that to, um, to um, uh, justify their uh, their Brown versus Board of Education ruling, and in, in so saying that uh, the Brown Court concluded to separate Black children from others of similar age and qualifications solely because of their race and there's a feeling of inferiority, feelings that never come into the Supreme Court before that. And so I wanted to express the feeling that working in out schools named after white supremacists created in Black professionals, and even white professionals in all, all you know, conscious human beings of going to school and honoring them with your talents and skills as, a, as an educator, um, where you, know, you are honoring the name of someone who the Confederacy wanted to mollify by naming them in the 1940s after naming these, these public institutions. You know, education is a public trust. So, um, so I, been hoping that we can continue. I'm going to go back a slide if I can. I worked with uh, a couple of, of, of wonderful organizations. The, uh, the Virginia NAACP was one of them. Mr. Barnett, we were able to turn over the schools' names in Hanover County um, with, with, this, um, with this information. Um, people across the country have been using the study to have these local fights. Um, in our district, um, you know, we we had um, the Washington Lawyers Committee come and help us, and in Hanover, um, help us fight, um, and just to make sure that the school boards were on notice that we were willing to take it to the next level to to the court system. Um, and unfortunately, with the martyrdom of George Floyd in 2020, it was an idea whose time had finally come. And so many school boards across the country um, willingly changed the names, but we want to have this as a, uh, a constitutional amendment. We'd like it to be, uh, you know, a vi we, we perceive it as a violation of the equals, Equal Protections Clause, just uh, as integration was. Um, so we're still fighting the battle um, with the uh, um, National Education Association on our side. And if we can get the Washington Lawyers Committee to do some more pro bono work, we'll be, we'll be, on, we'll be cooking with fire. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but there are lots of implications for future research or practice. Um, we can study the experiences of educators across the country in subpopulations, um, make sure that we have a consistent factual narrative of what the Civil War was. And although many, all of the educators, you know, um, would, would, were gracious enough to admit that those four years of the Civil War, you know, wreaked havoc for, you know, for society in general, it does not supersede 400 years of, 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 you know, of uh, enslavement of African Americans. I mean, they cannot supersede that. Um, so uh, um, we want to work, you know, launch uh, truth and reconciliation groups across the country. I mean, so we're working on a toolkit right now that we can uh, we can, we can distribute um, across to anyone who's interested in battling in the, battling this in their own local areas. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ferguson. Uh, we appreciate you helping us to understand the implications um, that uh, having schools named after uh, Confederacy leaders, leadership and the need to um, Confederate leaders um, and the need for the project that you have. We look forward to hearing more about that project. Our last presenter um, is Frederick Gooding. Frederick is an associate history professor uh, and the Dr. Ronald E. Moore Endowed Professor of Humanities at Texas Christian University in Fort Worth. Texas. Um, he will be pre presenting Black statues, what they stand to tell us in our nation's capital. Um, and he is virtual. So, uh, Frederick, do we have you? Uh, yes, I believe so. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am uh, not with you all in person because I am at Prairie View, Texas, 
And uh, it's like Sister Gabby was saying about feeling welcomed and connected, uh, my daughter uh, did not take just one gap year, but two. So we are very excited over the prospects of this child being able to fly out the nest, if you know what I'm saying. So I had to be here. I had to be here. <laughs> with that being said, uh, I just want to go ahead and put some thoughts out on the table with the time we have left. Um, and if you're curious, uh, you can um, uh, read a little bit more about this book project that I'm working on entitled Black Statutes, as um, I was researching with the National Gallery of Art, uh, you know, when I started a couple of years ago. So um, real quick quiz, y'all. Uh, can anyone name me the name of the statute? I'm sorry? Oh, okay. All right. So you passed that test. Okay. Well, how about this one? Uh, what's the name of the statute up top here? Y'all seen this building before? Remember January 6th? You may have seen it in the news. It's called the what? Mm. The See, that's the thing. That's what's so odd. You know, it's, it's, it's right in front of us, but a lot of people don't know the name of it, right? It's actually called the Statute of Freedom. And so what I like to suggest to everyone is similar to how the Statute of Liberty was this beacon of light for incoming, uh, you know, immigrants, this idea that the American dream was, you know, a possibility for many. And we all know the qualifications of that, right? Um, that I, you know, and again, my brother, uh, uh, Robert Munson was talking about a society that doesn't love us back, right? And so we all know about the racial friction we had to endure. The idea is that I would like to posit that for many African-Americans who moved north with the Great Migration, particularly to Washington, D.C., uh, in, the, in, the, in the advent of World War II, that the Statute of Freedom personified this idea that if there's one place you could go, in the country to get a fair shake, it would be DC, arguably the one place where the business is about democracy, freedom, justice. I, I think you all heard this before, right? Mm -hmm. And so the reason why I focus on black statutes in DC is because Washington DC has a unique or what I call constitutional responsibility to the public, right? One of the very few cities I know that has a street name after every state in the country, right? It's this idea that it represents all of who we are. And as you see here by this quote, um, what we cherish is an ideal for our nation as a whole must today be honestly exemplified by the federal establishment. And that was none other by President Dwight Dean Eisenhower who said this, right? And so um, that's the reason why I focus on Black statutes in DC because um, I think this is a, a project of national import, but as the African proverb goes, the elephant is eaten one bite at a time. And so this is the first bite that I would like to start with, right? As far as, okay, well, what's happening at the nation's capital when people come from all over the world and all over the country? And I focus on, uh, on this idea of, well, 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 first, let me just backtrack a little bit. When you talk about DC, one of the primary areas that people go to visit is the National Mall, as you know. Um, and I think what's so fascinating about the National Mall is that historically, for the longest time, there's virtually no African-American presence. And for those of you who remember, yes, there is a Museum of African Art as part of the Smithsonian, but African art is different than African-American presence, right? And, and so the African-American, uh, the National Museum of African-American History and Culture was just newly installed in 2016. And um, if you wanted to go see a museum dealing with Black culture, you had to take a metro, then take a bus and cross the river to the Anacostia Museum, right? Um, and so African-American presence was very minimal. The MLK Memorial uh, was installed in 2011. So very, very minimal. And so what's fascinating is, but when you do go, what is very, very ample and plentiful is this idea of the neoclassical style, right? And, and this is so, so very fascinating because um, if you go to Europe, you'll find chairs older than the United States of America. So when America was creating its uh, image, if you would, as far as, you know, what it wanted to represent, um, you know, in the Capitol, um, you know, back when it was building, uh, you know, they, they tell you with their own English uh, that they wanted to hearken after this Greek and Roman style from back in the day that, that they felt was the, the pinnacle of civilization, right? And so when we talk about, um, you know, what my sister Ferguson was talking about as far as cultural geography and symbology and messaging, the question is, well, where do we fit in this? Um, African-Americans who arguably had a hand in building this country, if not the capital itself. And for so those of you who know, uh, not too far from DC, what was the nickname of DC in the 70s? Chocolate, Chocolate City. City. Looks more like a mocha swirl now, right? Ha 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 right? But the idea being that that's how prominent African American presence was um, in this city, right? 
Um, you know, and so, and again, going back to like Greco-Roman style, if you go to the Smithsonian Museum, you'll find the statue of George Washington that actually was out in front of the Capitol for many years, right? You know, and again, you see how he looks more like a Roman emperor than a uh, democratic free leader. But then again, a democratic free leader arguably wouldn't own enslaved individuals, right? Mm -hmm. But that's the story for another set, for another day. Mount Vernon was a plantation, by the way. And so what's also fascinating is that when you talk about this idea of, you know, image, um, even the, the, the actual literal white sculptures that we see are a fiction and a fabrication. Um, you know, researchers have found that, the, the, if you do want to harken back to Greco-Roman times, that they're actually patina, I mean, they're actually painted images. And so there's this idea of everything being all lily white and this white ideal, you know, is something that we absolutely have to challenge and think critically about, right? So uh, just really quickly, because um, I know time is short, the uh, reason why I focus on statues is because they are built to last uh, and they are made for maximum viewership, right? Um, and so inherently as public works, they are political works, right? You don't just slap up a statue <laughs> overnight. You don't, you don't just do that, right? You know, there's a, there's a system of processes as to how that, that, that happens. And so I'm very fascinated with all the conversation about Confederate statues being taken down. Well, what statues remain? What statues were actually erected in our name and in our honor? That, that's what I'm curious about, right? All righty. And so um, my criteria is this. Um, they have to be uh, not just free to access, but freely accessible, right? So for example, there's a statue of Frederick Douglass uh, in, the, uh, in the center at his home in Southeast DC. It's free to access, but it's not freely accessible, meaning that you can only access it between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. when the center is open. Unlike the Lincoln Memorial and the National Mall, I can go there any hour tonight, 3 a.m. is there, it's out for everyone to see. Same thing like with the statute in the center of town by the courthouse, it's freely accessible. And so I think that's the distinction in terms of what was intended to be truly a part of our public fabric, right? So that's what I'm looking, interested to see. And notice this is my third bullet point, I'm looking at three-dimensional standalone exclusive human sculptures, not abstract. And again, I have nothing against black sculptors, God bless them, right? But I'm talking about three-dimensional human figures uh, because it, it's, it, it gives us information about who do we value and who's visible in society, particularly with respect to African-American influence. And so uh, how many statues are Black statues are there in D.C.? Well, I'd be a fool to tell you. I mean, this is the cliffhanger. You have to get the book, right? <laughs> it's great, it's great, great prize and present, okay? But re really quickly, what I'd like to do at the time I have remaining is just talk a little bit about a couple of Black statues to highlight. You know, what's so fascinating is the first black statue on federal lands was of Mary McLeod Bethune. Would anyone like to guess what year the uh, this, this statue was installed? 1974. <laughs> yeah, try 1974. Only mm. think about think about this. What does this say? If it takes nearly two centuries before you have a statute of a black individual on federal land, again, I mean, I, and I know we have all this discussion and, and, and controversy over CRT, but I find it virtually impossible as a historian to tell the story of American history without invoking African American history. You're talking about nearly two centuries, really? Oh, that's interesting. But what's so fascinating is this: you can find it in Lincoln Park which is a mile east of the Capitol. Remember that building in January 6th, we talked about this. Okay, and what's also in that same park is this statute. Mm. Uh, is right. Where's my sister? Uh, is right. Uh, is, right. Uh, is right. Now I got no one time, but bear with me, y'all. Bear with me, right? You know what I'm saying? I, you, know, I'm, I'm, you know, bear with me. Clearly what do your eyes tell you? Your eyes tell you that the brother, it says emancipation. Mm. So the brother might be free, but ladies and gentlemen, he is not equal, free, but not equal. And, and, if, and if you are confused about whether there was some sort of, uh, you know, a hierarchy here, what's interesting is behind the, the, the kneeling, what, what Frederick Douglass called at the dedication, couchant individual, right? Barely clothed with shackles on his uh, wrists, right? Behind him is what's called a pillory. And if you don't know what a pillory is, I'm glad to explain it to you as a historian. It's a whipping post. Now, notice the ivy. The ivy is there to symbolize, Sister Ferguson, that it is old and antiquated. Okay, hold that thought. Hold that thought. Okay, all right, we're, we're about to land this plane real quick. Okay, 
So here's how we're gonna land the plane. Uh, anyone heard of Penn State University? Well, here's the deal. You probably would not have heard of Penn State University were it not for the football team, no offense, right? In terms of billions of dollars generated, uh, television contracts, uh, paraphernalia, uh, you know, uh, admissions, et cetera, et cetera, through the roof. They had a statute of Joe Paterno, their coach, who led them to uh, 704 victories. He's the all-time leading coach uh, of football in FBS. This is the date where they took down his statute despite his significance to the university. Why? Because this is 30 days, ladies and gentlemen, 30 days after his assistant coach, Jerry Sandusky, was convicted of 14 counts of child molestation. So once the university realized that this statute was no longer in sync and commensurate with their values, guess what had to happen? Statute had to go. So when we talk about image, here's re recent current events. This brother named Afro Man is a rapper out of Ohio and police with a warrant busted down his door and, you know, with guns and, and, and gear, right? As you see the, the riot gear, um, you know, came through his house. He had it recorded on camera. And what he did is he took a sour situation when taking lemons, he decided to make lemonade and made a song out of it. This idea of, you know, making fun of the officers who came raided his home because this one officer you see with the glasses actually did a double take at the lemon pound cake. <laughs> now, speaking of image, here, here, y'all, guess who is suing who for humiliation and defamation? You got it right. The police are suing him for public defamation and humiliation when you talk about this idea of image. So I say all that to say. And that's what we're talking about, ladies and gentlemen. And that's what we're talking about. Why is the statue still standing? What is it still communicating? So in conclusion, because I know one time, I appreciate y'all's patience. So statutes are more than just mere art in a park. We would do ourselves a disservice to merely jog by these, these uh, edifices, thinking that you know they're, they're just there for artistic sake. Quite the contrary. There are pliable political portraits right, that tell us much about the value and visibility of African Americans in society. And we need to critically ask the question, who is the we that represents us? Because we have an opportunity to influence the future. And Kahindi Wally, props to him. Uh, for those of you in Virginia, you know that um, in Richmond, there's this installation that they put in New York Times Square that challenged this idea of Stonewall Jackson, right, in terms of image. So we have that ability to, to do this using art moving forward, right? And, and for many people, this was, you know, considered, well, what are you doing, right? But at the same time, when we talk about image, we have to look very, very carefully about the political implications because when you look at that statute of freedom, I hate to bear, break the bad news, but yes, the ultimate irony is not only do we have a country whose first president owned individuals, if that's such a thing, well, he, you know, right? But the Statute of Freedom was actually cast and built by an enslaved individual. His name is Philip Reed. Thomas Crawford gets the credit as the sculptor. Clark Mills was the one who cast it, but Clark Mills employed or used the labor of an enslaved individual named Philip Reed to cast the <laughs> Statute of Freedom. So what do Black statues have to tell us, ladies and gentlemen? Time will tell. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Frederick, for an engaging discussion. That was very, very nice. Um, I'm going to look to um, my partners over here. Are we doing Q&A with the time? That we can do a little Q&A because Q &A. Okay. it's like lunch now. Oh, the next, yes. okay. The next presentation is until 1230. Okay. So if we want to go till 12, okay. I think that's fine. And if anybody wants lunch, then feel free to do yeah. so, Right. So so um, right now is, is lunch for those of you who would like to... Um, to do that, but if anyone wants, if, if anyone wants to stay behind, if our if our uh, panelists are um, uh, able to do so, if you have any questions for our panelists, um, we'll do a Q and A session now. Um, I had a, if no, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, yeah, in the back, go ahead. <laughs> 
Hi, um, I wanted to ask the panelists how they see their work informing or interacting with each other. We have to work on the inside. We have we have many fronts. These battles have many fronts. Individually, um, real work, you know, working with girls of color, um, just iconography, symbolism in which we surround ourselves, you know, we all want to be ergonomically sound and you know, move through space without, you know, confronting negativity. So, oh, late. <laughs> okay. Uh, another question, I think, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is for Dr. Gooding, so you may have to repeat my question. Frederick, can you hear her? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, good. Um, that was a very engaging presentation, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, I guess I have a two-part question. One is, have you ever looked across the country to see where statues of African Americans, particularly United States pillar troops, have been placed? Um, and then secondly, what would you think as a historian would be the most appropriate for a, a statue of African American or of African American history tied to Washington, D.C. be? What would that look like if we were to put it along the National Mall? What would be your first idea of incorporating a statue on the National Mall? Well, thank you for your question and you know for, for listening. Um, in terms of the first question, um, yes, I, I definitely started looking at nationally where statues are located. But again, in terms of um, the book project, um, you know, I had to start small. But but this is hopefully something I'm looking to expand. You know, maybe developing even a, an app. You know, get getting the public involved with the charting of their own history geocaching. Because what I found is this: what's so fascinating is that um, you're you're probably going to find. Um, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King and Harriet Tubman is probably two leading, um, you know, uh, individuals who have statutes of, of, of them, you know, all across. But well, also there's this other qualification of when you do find, if and when you do find a Black statute, um, most often you're going to find that they may be connected to entertainment or sports, right? And and also they are what I call quasi-public, right? Meaning that, you know, they're out in, uh, maybe in, uh, you know, maybe uh, university settings or out in front of, you know, stadiums, you know, so still not that, that full-fledged the whole entire public and environment has said, this is a person who's a part of our community that is so very valuable. And so we want to represent them as a part of our community and values moving forward in perpetuity. So I think it will be fascinating to actually map and chart where exactly they're located in town and where across the country, and also to see what the trends are and how many of women, you know, how many of non entertainers and athletes, you know, do, do we have, right? But going back to your second question, um, we do actually have. A statute, if you would, of an individual in the National Mall, and that would be of Dr. Martin Luther King, right? And that by the title basin, they installed it in 2011. And here's the catch, though. Um, what I am going to talk about in the book is technically, now again, don't, don't shoot the messenger, but technically, according to the research and the books in the National Gallery of Art, what you see in the National Mall is not a statute. It's actually high bass relief. So in other words, when you see Dr. King, he's like half chiseled out of the stone. And apparently it was like the symbolic and a message of the work is still not finished or done. He's being hewn out of a mountain of despair. But what's so fascinating is this idea that he's still not three-dimensional in the round, unlike Thomas Jefferson, who has a memorial in the title basin, and also a Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who has two statues of himself and a seven acre plot also in the title basin. And also when you go to Dr. King's memorial or monument, what's fascinating is in contrast to say the Jefferson Memorial and also the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorial, the lack of storytelling that's involved, right? So there's still a little bit of a hierarchy. He has 14 quotes that are kind of randomly scattered. They're not dated. And also there was a controversy over the quote that was installed on the side. You know, it was like truncated, the drum major quote. And finally, there was controversy over his furrowed brow. So, you know, when you go to the, the monument, there's virtually no context about what was he fighting against, right? He was just giving speeches because he just loved poetry. No, the idea was he was fighting against white supremacy. And, and, and there's really no contextualization of that. And an idea that he had a furrowed brow and that was 
considered to be too militant. Well, of course he had righteous indignation. You should be angry over the fact that you pay taxes. You're, you're, you're born into a country where you, we hold these truths to be self-evident. And then if that's not shaking out, of course he would be frustrated. But they had to revise the, the, you know, his. So in other words, it's so fascinating how there's you know, layers to this in terms of how we're still you know, uh, representing our, ourselves and our image, you know, even down to the classroom in terms of how we tell the story and how we remember um, our own history when it comes to say critical race theory or simple African-American history at the uh, advanced placement level in Florida. Uh, one, one more real quick question. Yes, sir, go ahead. Uh, daily, I drive through an intersection that's divided by the street called John Tyler, who was the 10th president of the United States and owned slaves. Um, why can't we take that, change that street name? Well, we can, but the question is, who's the we, right? And so this is where true <laughs> concepts of democracy come into play in terms of it really, you know, it's so fascinating how small groups of people make decisions that affect large groups of people, right? And so to the extent that, um, you know, we are not involved in these conversations, um, we don't have access, we don't know when the meetings are and where they're held, then then you're right. There, the, But there are processes, there, there are ways in which we can, you know, um, raise our voice. And you saw a glimpse of that open up in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder in 2020. But, you know, the, the, the question is, how do we sustain that type of momentum where people are activated and want to stay involved? Many of us are, you know, uh, under stress and oppressed. And so it's very difficult to take time out of the day to, you know, show up at the meetings and, 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 and when you're just merely, merely trying to survive, right? You know, I mean, and, and many of my other pan panelists talked about this in terms of, you know, you know, disability society and feeling welcome to one, Gabby, and, you know, and, and the messages that we see in schools. And so, you know, it's a very complex issue, but I think for me, what I'm trying to do is, you know, with the first step is the awareness of like, okay, um, you know, here's something that we still need to talk about because statutes are not static, they are pliable, and we have the opportunity to change them as we move forward in time. Yes, I would love. I'd like to answer Ms. Swanson's question. Thank you, Dr. Whitting. Um, this is Dr. Burks. Um, and the school was the school um was changed from Stonewall Jackson to Westside, Westside um Middle School. And uh, we wanted it to be Catherine Johnson, but the pendulum just stopped in neutral, um, in a neutral zone. And to answer your question a little bit too, um, in my um, presentation, there's a QR code about the coalition that was built around it. Um, I don't know if I can get get back to it, but um, I can give you the QR code really quickly if you wouldn't mind. Um, not right here. It's interested. Oh, it's here. Oh, it's not a QR code. Okay, it's um, thought I threw a QR code in here, but it's called "What's in a Name." It's by West Virginia Bill, and so it's a 15-minute documentary about the coalition that was built, including a lot of allies, um, the other nonprofits, um, to change that name and get to a board meeting. And and you know, you have to know when the meetings are, and it took some research. Thank you for everyone. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your participation, um, panelists. Um, and then I will now.